<clears throat> hey everyone, back for another review. This time we're going anime. I just came back from a Fathom event. So I thought, let's talk about this. None other than the 1998 <clears throat> anime movie called Perfect Blue. Okay, Perfect Blue is based off of a manga. It's directed by first time anime director uh, Satoshiro Khan. If I fucked up that name. What can you do? <laughs> um, it's about Mima Kitagoy, Kitagoy, who is transitioning from her role as a pop idol into being a movie actress and being a star in that field. And we go about how she's being stalked by someone and her rapid descent mentally as she starts to break down from moving away from her old image and into um, an acting role where your image is really how you're seen on the screen. So she she starts to have conflicting feelings about what she's doing as increasingly the roles that she's told to be to do on this show get ever away from her traditional role as just kind of like being a pop star and being seen as especially a teeny bopper. This is a movie that can really, um, kind of ahead of its time because as you see, or something that can, that always goes through cycles because you can see a musical act when they start young. You have this image of them as being wholehearted, as being uh, very relatable and grounded and then they start to move on to different fields or to try to change their image where there'll be uh, things like they'll start doing risque photo, photo shoots where they'll start exposing themselves or in this case where she becomes an actress and she starts to do a role where they ask her to do scenes like i.e. get raped by a mob so she's dealing with that psychologically as well as the people dealing with her around her, including the people in her agency, uh, especially her, I guess, main agent by the name of Rumi. And <clears throat> you also see the backlash from the fandom. There is a stalker who is obsessed with her, but doesn't like the change in her role. So there's a lot of things. It, it, Throw in Britney Spears somewhere in this commentary and it will work. I saw this movie in, th in, a, in a really crappy theater back in, I think, 99. So I've seen this almost 20 years ago. And I just saw it today in a, in a much better theater. And there are certain things about the movie that has age and has an age. One, the animation. It's up and down, kind of. It's... It, you can tell it's it's an it's a 90s anime because of the fact that it's it, there's really very little CGI and if, if it is CGI it's not glaring but you can tell it's kind of CGI you can also tell it's old school because the characters look like they were actually drawn instead of map shaded or drawn on um, on palettes like they do now so you can tell this was done on cells. Um, you can also tell it's an old anime because if you didn't need to move, you didn't. And also I never noticed this before I saw it today. When they have wide shots and they do shots of crowds, there are times where the characters have no faces. You'll see like a, a uh, peach blotch no eyes, no mouth, no nothing. And it's ha it happens a couple of times in the movie, especially early on. Um, so yeah, that's how you can tell it's like an older style anime. Um, also, uh, the voice acting, while I like the girl who played uh, the main character, and I like the girl who played Rumi, who is also the voice, her name is Wendell Lee, I believe. She also does the voice of Faye Valentine from Cowboy Bebop. 
So there goes your fact. I was kind of hoping that the main character was played by Amanda Wynn Lee from Neon Genesis Evangelion because she kind of sounded like it at times, but I, it wasn't. It was someone else. Um, also, um, I don't. There were weird choices in the dub, especially when uh, the main character is calling her mom and she's speaking with like a southern accent. Really sounded off, especially in this movie where it's 100% Japan, even to the point of the opening where they have their version of rip-off Power Rangers at a festival. Also, I don't... I, I need to go re-watch the subtitled version of it because I really don't think they understand what the meaning of the word pop idol is. The whole crux of the problem is she's supposedly moving away from being a pop idol to being a movie or an actress and but at points in the movie they point out how her group Cham her and these two other girls never had a top 100 hit and they make mention of it because there's a part where once um, she leaves the other two have a top eight they have an 83 hit single their one of the singles went to the was at number 83 on the top 100 and they're celebrating. It's like, wait, how can you be a pop icon if no one was buying the records? Anyway, um, that could be just a dub thing, but this movie is really good as far as it goes to the visuals of it. I've heard a lot of people compare this to an Alfred Hitchcock psycho psychological, psychological thriller, and it kind of is. I'm not sure about going as far as saying the Hitchcock thing, but it is a psychological thriller as you see the descent more of the main character into madness. And there are parts where you can't tell if she's going crazy or it's edited really well where you couldn't tell if she was on the TV show. And, and it works really well because she's on this TV show where um, she is, it's a TV show called uh, Double Blind and she, at first she plays a character of some of a, a sister of someone else then as they try to give her more lines in the movie and uh, more, more lines in the show in a bigger role there's a part where she has a there's a rape scene and it's supposed to affect her character, which works very heavily into this show because the rest of the t in the TV show, she's having a hard time dealing with the fact that she was raped, and it works along in the real life because she's having a hard time with what she has to do in the show. So it's those two angles hitting you, and there are times where you, where a scene will shift, and you can't tell if she's on the TV show or if this is happening in real life. There are also some really good visual cues, cues near the end when you finally find out who the bad guy is and the distortion of reality is continuing where you would see characters interacting with each other but you don't know whose perspective it is in. And then there are parts where you will see the characters either seeing each other or seeing the world as what they're psychologically wanted to be and and you will see like mirrors or images in the background or you will see just straight up characters change in front of you from what they think they see to what reality is. There's a scene where uh, there's, there's a fight scene and you'll see the villain moving along as I either how she believes she is or how the main character sees she is and then alongside of it you'll see like a mirror showing you exactly what really is happening and it's really visually good especially when you get to the third act um, there's a whole subplot with a stalker um, I like Mima's character the main character because you know, it's very pressing and, and it's 
it's showing someone who's not ready. And, and in the movie, there are parts where they tell you she's only in her 20s. So it's not like this is an older person. Um, I really like that part about it. Uh, I like the part that Mima has to deal with. Kind of stuff, you can tell this movie definitely is of its time. It came out in 98. So she has to deal with getting a computer for the first time. Figuring out how to work the internet. Um, it definitely plays to its time. She has a TV that has a, a VHS um, slot in it. So it has details of that time and it works for that period of time. But I think the general story of it, the whole thing about the pop idol, pop idol, whatever, the, the music singer who wants to be an actress and starts like losing her mind because she has to do things she's never had to do before. It is a lot about growing up in the industry really quickly as well. So I really like this movie. <coughs> um, I really hope because I know with a lot of these Fathom events that it's a prelude for a DVD release. I, I found out that no one really owns the rights to this. It used to be owned by a company called, um, I believe, Manga Entertainment. But right now, no one owns the rights to it. I kind of hope they give it a re-release and hopefully a, a new dub. The main characters are good. Some of the side characters, not so much. <clears throat> but it is a really good movie. It is a good psychological thriller. I liked it a lot. The animation at times doesn't hold up. Um, this isn't Akira. You're not going to go back and go, oh, this isn't Ghost in the Shell once again. Um, it kind of falls more along, along the lines of a TV show that got a little bit extra money in it, but the story was enough where it didn't feel like a TV show. I like this Perfect Blue a lot. Um, I'm glad I saw it in theaters again, in a good theater this time. I give it a 7.8. Um, it's I can re I recommend you go see it if you like thrillers, if you like psychological thrillers, if you like anime. This will check off all the boxes. Only problem is the DVD will be hard to find because it's been out of print for a while. Um, like I said, hopefully it gets re-released in the next couple weeks and that's kind of it for now. Yeah, I like Perfect Blue. Um, did you get to see it as a fathom event? Let me know about your experience in the comments below. Or did you just see Perfect Blue in general? Let me know your thoughts on it. What do you think? Did the voices not bother you or just one of those people who just watch it on subtitles? And please, if you did, let me know about how the subtitles translated the pop icon thing because it didn't work in English because it didn't make any sense. So I gave it a 7.8. Um, that's it for now. Uh, I have another Fathom event. I have two more Fathom events coming up soon. One of them this weekend and another one in a couple weeks. And I will do, be doing reviews for both of them. So that's it for now. Um, talk to you later. Gucci.